I probably have the best job in the world. Um, I get to uh, invite every year, I basically get to invite my heroes and my friends and some young journalists and send them off around the world. Um, I was going to sort of walk you through our sort of journey over the last year. Um, the nice thing about being a journalist is you get to learn about things you know nothing about. You can ask lots of stupid questions. All of you know a lot about big data. I started knowing nothing about it. I'm going to give you sort of a quick background. I have a, a very small company that uses, we have literally hundreds of people around the world that work on these projects. So some of you may be familiar with these day in the life books. 100 photographers one day on your market said go, turned down by every publisher in the world who told us what a stupid idea it was. Um, we then started looking at topics like the global water crisis or how the uh, human race is learning to heal itself. We're the first year of the internet. The thing we've been trying to do is sort of help uh, explain complex things to people like my mother or my kids uh, in a way that, that, that we, you know, pho photographs are sort of this international language of, of sort of telling stories. One of the things I never realized is that when you invite people representing magazines like Time and Newsweek and National Geographic and publications around the world, they go back to their editors and suddenly we had this sort of wa wonderful built-in uh, visibility for these projects that normally books don't get. I found my next favorite thing one day when I was just going through the bookstore. One of my favorite things to do is to go to the bookstore. Y'all heard? Okay. So that's sort of the died and gone to heaven moment in publishing. It doesn't ever get any better than that. So about a year ago, um, I was at uh, All Things uh, Digital. I ran into uh, Marissa Meyer, who was then at uh, Google. And uh, we were talking, and, and, and she was saying, what's your next project going to be? And I said, I know, we're trying to figure out what we should be focusing on. And she said, you should look at this world of big data. And I said, what's big data? I've been hearing sort of my friends in Silicon Valley talking about it. And she said, well, some people describe it as so much data doesn't fit on your laptop. And I said, okay, it doesn't sound very interesting. And she said, well, other people describe it as data from one source overlap with data from another source, and we see these patterns in it. And I said, you know, I'm a photographer. I don't, I don't, I don't really understand how that, you know sounds interesting, but nothing I would, could do, do a project about. And then she said, well, the best metaphor I've heard is that people are describing this as watching the Earth, the planet, develop a nervous system. And I thought, wait a second, explain that one to me again. And she started talking to me, and she gave me some really interesting examples. She, in fact, she came up with like the first five assignments for this book. One of the things she did, she showed me this Terrific quote by Eric Schmidt. Again, I know that all of you know this intimately, but for the average person, the idea that data is growing at this rate of, of, of change is something that, even if someone doesn't know what an exabyte is, when you actually uh, show them this quote from Eric Schmidt, they sort of get it pretty quickly. The second thing that I started learning as I spoke to other friends in this world is that the cost of sensing things the, is plummeting, that all of us have become human sensors. And the, and the cost of now measuring things and generating data is going down incredibly quickly. The cost of analyzing it is also going down very quickly. So the ability to now um, measure and analyze and collect data um, and then visualize it and then respond while it's still happening is something as a species we've never really had before. And then my friend Esther Dyson told me that these devices that we have all over the world now are starting to talk to each other. There's this internet of things that these devices are now starting to change their behavior based on each other's um, activities. The way that the general media has been covering this story till about six months ago Whenever you heard big data, you heard Big Brother right after it. And it rem reminded me of the early days of the internet where people said, well, what's this I internet, what's this cyberspace thing? Remember we called it cyberspace in the early days? Um, and people were saying, isn't this just email with pictures or a better way to deliver pornography? And sure, it was, but th it actually did some other things as well. And I think a lot of the thing, the scary stuff that you hear about big data, and there's definitely things we have to be concerned about, but I think a lot of what we're hearing is, uh, is a, the, just a small portion, uh, and, and I think it's very easy for the media to glom onto this, but I think the story is much more interesting. My 10-year-old hears me on the phone all the time working on this project. He comes in to, to my office late at night sometimes, and he says, Dad, I keep hearing you on the phone talking about big data. What's this big data thing you keep talking about? And I was trying to think, how do you explain to a 10-year-old? That's the ultimate test, right? So I was thinking, um, Jesse, imagine if your whole life you've been looking through one eye, and all of a sudden, for the first time, scientists gave you the ability to open up a second eye. So what you're getting is not just more data. You're not just getting more vision. You're getting a different dimension, a different way of seeing. And he said, Dad, could computers open like a third eye and a fourth and a thousand eyes. And I said, that's exactly what's going on. We're able to take these vast quantities of information now, and it gives us all these different dimensions of seeing things that are in front of us, but we couldn't see them before. So for the last 18 months, we've had this team of photographers all over the world, and journalists, and writers, and illustrators, trying to capture this human face. And you're probably wondering, was it like pictures of servers or something? Let me show you some of the, the pictures. And one of the things I was just telling Ed a minute ago, um, 
And Alistair said, uh, in two hours, I'm going to have a real copy of this book. Any of you have ever done books know what it's like when you've been looking at a PDF and all of a sudden you have something you can actually touch. So let me tell you some of the stories in the book and some of the pictures. And I'm going to talk really quick because I've got four minutes left here. And this is like a half an hour talk. Um, again, this, is, this book is aimed not necessarily at all of you, although I think you'll probably uh, enjoy it because it helps you explain what you do. But the amount of information that an average person today is exposed to is as much as somebody from the 15th century was exposed to in their entire life, just to put this in perspective. The amount of information that's generated during the first day of a baby's life today is equivalent to 70 times the information contained in the Library of Congress. And as you all know now, uh, nothing that we do ever disappears. So any of you are ever planning to run for uh, political office? Nothing that you do as a teenager is ever, I mean, this, the world where everything's being recorded all the time, uh, this, this, the, that world of privacy and invisibility and that anonymity is rapidly disappearing. And obviously the effect of uh, data transparency as it's amplified by Twitter and Facebook, is having an enormous effect on, on politics around the world. Here are some specific examples. The day the earthquake hit last year, horrible, horrible uh, tragedy and disaster in Japan. What, very, what ma- most people never heard was that 23 seconds before the earthquake hit, every factory and every bullet train in Japan stopped. They put a half a million dollar, half a billion dollar uh, er- early earthquake warning system. It took them 15 years to build it, dedicated sensors, hardwired, and it worked. It saved a lot of lives. But what I found really interesting is there's an organization in Palo Alto called Quake Catcher where they use the accelerometer in your laptop. So you fire this program up, you go to bed, you leave it running, and all over the world there are people now running Quake Catcher as a, as a free, ubiquitous, crowdsourced early earthquake warning system. And I love this idea that people are doing this simply to help each other. In the South Pacific, they're putting sensors on animals like elephant seals, letting them loose in the ocean. When they come close to one of the 60 transponders you see on the bottom right, the data is being transferred into the transponders up to the surface and up to a satellite. My kids love this, the idea of animals helping us map the planet. Sweet Doc Patel, <clears throat> it's 27 years old. It's his third startup. He's a, a MacArthur fellow. Imagine if you got your American Express card to, tomorrow, your bill, and there's no itemization. He said, well, that's what happens if we get our electrical bill every month. There's no breakdown. We have no idea what we're spending our money on. So he has a little chip he invented. Plug it into your house, and he recognizes the digital signature of every appliance in your house. Turns out the average American spends 10% of our monthly electrical bill on the DVR. It's a group of uh, sociologists who look at all the crime data for the city of New York and mapped it. And they came up with what they call million-dollar blocks. So these are blocks where Mayor Bloomberg and the city of New York spends a million dollars a year to incarcerate people who lived in these buildings before they went to jail. And you may say, well, that's another neighborhood to avoid. But you also might say, me, this is where you put an early childhood intervention, career counseling, drug counseling, something to try to go to the source of where this is coming from. Half the drugs in Africa today are counterfeit. They look just like the medicine you and I would buy in a pharmacy, but they're sugar or worse. So a gentleman uh, named Bright Simons invented a little device where uh, on the back of every uh, 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 bottle, there's, a, there's a, a little code you can SMS in, and it tells you while you're there at the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical counter whether or not the drugs you're about to buy are actually uh, accurate. I'm going to go through these very quickly. Um, there's so many stories in this book, and literally, it was so hard at the beginning to tell the stories, and then it was like, which of your children make it into the lifeboats? There were so many stories that we couldn't fit in, into uh, the actual fit, uh, book. Um, I'm going to, again, go very quickly through here, because I want to share a couple other things with it. Um, there's a lot of stories about, you know, who owns the data that we're all generating. Why is that everyone's making money off of us, about off of our data, except we ourselves? This is pizza delivery in New York City on a Friday night. Uh, little GPS devices on bicycles kind of fun. We had Nigel Holmes, one of the world's leading infographic designers, do these wonderful infographics looking at companies like Google and uh, the world of advertising, how big data is starting to affect all these different industries. 23andMe, where you can now look into your genetic makeup and find out uh, what diseases or conditions you may be prevalent to developing later in life. Um, Again, I'm going so quickly here. I love this idea that there's a digital version of us now out there in the world, that everything we're doing is being recorded and digitized. And these are things that the ability to now go in and triangulate this information is really pretty fascinating. We're delivering 10,000 copies of this book that I just held up to world leaders, Fortune 500 CEOs, heads of media companies, many of you in this room perhaps, on one day thanks to uh, FedEx. EMC is the sponsors behind this whole project. Um, It's not product placement. They basically gave us the ability to go out and tell the story of the development of big data. There's one last thing I want to say just before I finish. We have a smartphone app where we've invited people all over the world 
It's called, it's human face of big data. It's an Android and an iOS app. It allows you to compare your life to other people around the world. Join millions of people around the globe to measure our world using your smartphone. You can share and compare. Map your daily footprint. Share what brings you luck. Get a glimpse into the one thing people want to experience during their lifetime and discover hidden secrets about the world you live in. Curious what your phone can tell you about your life? Compare answers with millions of others globally. Find your data doppelganger, someone just like you, somewhere else in the world. We'll donate $1 per download to Charity Water for the first 50,000 downloads as a way to say thank you for participating in the human face of big data. Charity Water uses 100% of public donations to directly fund clean water projects. Participate in one of the largest collaborative events in history and help measure our world. The point of this is simply to give people the ability to take data, see how they compare to other people around the world. We are asking really interesting questions. If you could change the DNA of your child before they were born and only choose one thing, immunity, intelligence, uh, or appearance, what would you choose? And then it, how did eldest born males in China who had a strict mother who grew up with a dog answer those questions? This is just sort of a fun project. It gives people uh, out in the world an idea of how data is now giving them a way of comparing themselves and learning about each other. Um, the whole project here, the design of this, the purpose of it is not to say big data is going to solve all of our problems, but I actually think that big data is going to be much more important to our species than even the internet. I think the internet was a step along the way, and um, I think this quote from Marshall McLuhan is a wonderful way to, to end this. I think it's very interesting that we're sort of extending our senses out around the world and having this, it really is like watching the planet develop a nervous system. So thank you all very much, and, and Ed and Julie and uh, Alistair and Tim O'Reilly, thank you so much for all the help you guys have given us in the course of the last year. Thanks.